Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News R, India's voice to the world. I'm Shubhendu Ghosh, coming up in the next hour. Over 140 killed and many injured in one of the deadliest terror attacks in Russia. 11 suspects detained. President Putin says those responsible would be punished. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres visits Egypt's border with Gaza, says now more than ever it is time for an immediate ceasefire. Prime Minister Narendra Modi returns home after concluding historic visit to Bhutan, new milestones achieved in India's development partnership with the Himalayan Kingdom. And in cricket, Sam Curran pass Punjab Kings to victory against Delhi Capitals in their Indian Premier League opening match. Russia is on high alert after brutal terror attack at a concert hall near Moscow on Friday evening. Death toll has crossed 140. All the gunmen have been apprehended. While Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack, United States claims it had shared credible intelligence on the attack. President Putin in his address to the nation has said those responsible for the attack will be punished. One of the deadliest terror attacks in Russia in two decades. Armed men went on a shooting rampage at the Crocus City Hall near Moscow on Friday. The concert venue was packed with attendees when the gunfire erupted. At least 143 people were killed, many more injured. I was right there on the west side of the shopping mall. Suddenly I heard sounds like firecrackers but had no clue what was actually happening. Then I saw lots of people running. Addressing the nation, Russian President Vladimir Putin said that all those responsible for this deadly attack will be punished. He added that the attackers had sought to escape towards Ukraine. Now the main thing is to not let those behind this bloodbath to commit new crimes. Regarding the investigation of this crime and results of operational search actions, I can now say the following. All four of the actual performers of the act of terror, all those who shot and killed people were found and detained. They tried to hide and were moving in the direction of Ukraine. There, according to the preliminary data, they had a crossing of the border prepared from the Ukrainian side. Overall, 11 people were detained. <laughs> President Putin and his Belarusian counterpart Alexander Lukashenko confirmed their readiness to work together in the fight against terrorism over a phone call. Russia's foreign ministry calls the shooting a terrorist attack. Eleven people have been arrested, including four suspected gunmen. Militant Islamic group Islamic State Khorasan has claimed responsibility for this attack. United States claims it had intelligence confirming Islamic State's claim of responsibility for a deadly shooting. Apparently, United States had warned Russia in recent weeks about the possibility of an attack. Responders in Moscow mobilized to contain a massive blaze the size of a soccer field after the attack. In light of the attack, the Russian Ministry of Culture has announced cancellation of all mass and entertainment events at federal cultural institutions for the coming days. Hundreds of people queued up near blood donation centers in Moscow on Saturday morning for those injured in the shooting rampage at the concert hall. Sevastopol residents brought toys and flowers, lit candles at a makeshift memorial for the victims. I came to honor the memory of those who died, who suffered from terrorism. This is just unbearable. Russian Railways has increased security measures on trains and railway stations in connection with the attack. Security measures have been strengthened at transport infrastructure facilities and in crowded places in the Moscow region. 
And world leaders expressed shock and extended condolences to victims of shooting near Moscow and Russia. Condemning the attack, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi said, India stands in solidarity with the government and people of Russia. UN chief leaders from EU, Turkey and other world leaders too extended messages of solidarity with people of Russia in this hour of grief. An attack near Moscow at concert goers on Friday brought back memories of the 2004 Beslan school siege. The five gunmen dressed in camouflage on Friday opened fire with automatic weapons at people attending a concert in the Krokus City Hall near Moscow. The Kremlin said Russian President Vladimir Putin was updated on the concert attack by the FSB director. Putin wished a speedy recovery to those injured in the attack. Soon global condemnation and messages of solidarity poured in. The UN chief, United States, European Union and India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, among others, condemned the attack and sent their condolences. The images are just horrible um, and uh, just hard to watch and our thoughts obviously are going to be with the, the victims of this terrible, terrible shooting attack. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi in a social media post on X said, We strongly condemn the heinous terrorist attack in Moscow. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families of the victims. India stands in solidarity with the government and the people of the Russian Federation in this hour of grief. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned the attack in the strongest possible terms. According to a statement attributable to the Deputy Spokesperson Farhan Haq, the Secretary General conveys his deep condolences to the bereaved families and the people and the government of the Russian Federation. He wishes those injured a speedy recovery. European Union spokesman Peter Santo in a statement posted on X said that the EU is shocked and appalled by the reports of a terrorist attack in the Krokus City Hall in Moscow. The EU condemns any attacks against civilians. Our thoughts are with those Russian citizens affected. Condemning the attack, French President Emmanuel Macron said in the statement that France stands in solidarity with the victims of the shooting. While the German Foreign Office said that the images of the terrible attack on innocent people in Crocus City Hall near Moscow are horrific. The background must be investigated quickly. Our deepest condolences with the families of the victims. Following the attack, all entertainment and mass events were cancelled in Russia. A billboard near the concert hall read a message, We grieve. Following the attack, firefighters had to battle a massive blaze as flames leapt into the sky and plumes of black smoke rose above the venue. The emergency services evacuated hundreds of people while parts of the venue's roof collapsed. Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attack. Fuzel Ahmed reporting for DD India. And DD India correspondent Dasha Chernyshova joins us live from Moscow. Dasha, there has been a dramatic rise in the number of casualties in the Moscow attack. How is Russia recovering? What is the latest on the death toll and condition of the injured? Well, indeed, as the investigators and the rescuers have started the operations on the first floor of the Crocus City Hall, the death toll has significantly increased. The latest we have from the investigative committee is 133. This is because the uh, rubble has started to be moved on this first floor. We understand that 63 cubic meters of the constructions that have uh, collapsed have been removed from the scene of this tragedy right behind me. Uh, also, the Russian authorities are implementing all the increased measures of security across the Russian capital as well as some other regions with more uh, controls at the critical junctures such as airports, railroad stations. So certainly the investigation is ongoing. We understand that there are more people still in hospitals, some of them in the critical condition, so that these deaths still could further increase. But what matters at the moment is that the investigators have access to all the details that will help them establish the sequence of the events that led to this deadly tragedy. Dasha, the terror group ISIS-K is said to have claimed responsibility for the attack. Uh, the attackers have been apprehended. Where does the investigation go from here? Is uh, there any Ukraine link also being analyzed?
Well, we've heard the Russian President Vladimir Putin issuing his statements to the people of Russia and saying that actually four men who have been involved in the shooting have been detained. They are no longer at large. And uh, the, they are being interrogated. Some of the videos of those interrogations suggest that people have been receiving money uh, in exchange for uh, what they have committed here for these acts of terrorism. We are also getting some of the uh, reports saying, uh, the, the, some of the reports saying that they have tried to leave the Russian Federation by going all the way from Moscow to the Bransk region and then trying to cross into the Ukrainian territory. This is because the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, said there was an opening in the border that has been created by someone. That's why the authorities say they need to find all the accomplices that helped them store the weapons inside Krakow City Hall long before the attack happened, as well as to plan the, uh, the, the route so that they can leave. Also, we understand this is the uh, investigative committee that, uh, of the Russian Federation that will be looking into this matter, is to see how uh, these people have been hired. Because in one of the videos of the interrogation, uh, the, the suspect said that he was uh, hired via telegram. Uh, we do know about these four men, that none of them is the citizen of the Russian Federation. They are all foreigners. Dasha, I appreciate you joining us with those updates from Moscow. On to some other stories now. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi arrived home at Delhi on Saturday after a successful state visit to Bhutan. Ending the special visit with yet another special gesture, the King of Bhutan, Jigme Kaiser Namgyal Wangchuk, and Prime Minister of Bhutan, Sharing Tabge, both came to see off Prime Minister Modi at the airport. And earlier on Saturday, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, along with his Bhutanese uh, counterpart, uh, Shering Topge inaugurated the Gyaltsun Jetsung Pema Mother and Child Hospital in Thimpu. It is a state-of-the-art hospital built with India's assistance. The newly constructed hospital would add value to the quality of mother and child health services in the Himalayan Kingdom. The facility stands as a shining example of India-Bhutan partnership in healthcare. So we have to leave the first bit that we have fully completed and it's functioning and this is the one we have today. On a two-day visit to the Himalayan Kingdom, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced further support of 10,000 crore rupees or about 1.25 billion US dollars to the neighboring country's 13th development plan. Prime Minister of Bhutan, Sharing Tobge, extended his gratitude to India's Prime Minister for the 10,000 crore rupees assistance to his nation. Bhutan was honored to receive Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji on a two-day state visit to Bhutan. The two-day state visit couldn't have gone any better. He was welcomed with open hearts by every citizen of Bhutan. And uh, this visit, this historic visit, is going to further strengthen the already strong relations between our two countries and our two people. And Bhutanese Prime Minister Shering Tobge also thanked Prime Minister Modi for visiting Bhutan. In a social media post, a Bhutanese Prime Minister says, and I quote, a big thank you to my brother, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji, for visiting us. Neither his busy schedule nor inclement weather could prevent him from fulfilling his promise to visit us. This must be the Modi's guarantee phenomena. Time for a short break still to come on DD India News R. Indian Navy brings 35 captured Somali pirates for trial. US lawmakers pass $1.2 trillion spending package to avoid government shutdown. Slovak's vote in a presidential election that could strengthen Prime Minister Robert Fico's grip on power. In today's episode, let's try to understand what does it mean to truly celebrate 
all women. Let's uncover the layers of their struggles in different walks of life. My biggest motivation was to save the environmental waste that I was creating, to reduce the carbon footprint, waste footprint. And when we talk about menstrual waste or periods as a topic, I think this fits in very well with the intersection of social and environmental issues. The weather in Meghalaya is definitely one of the center points of how we design these systems. And then sort of maybe just take the worst region in the state and try and design a system that is designed to work in that situation. We address financial education topics, from making a family budget to creating a small business plan for micro-enterprises. Topics also include health and wellness for women. Global temperatures have changed these days. That too, it doesn't rain when it needs to rain. And in this situation, the only crop that survives is millet. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Shubhendu Ghosh. Fighting raged on on Saturday around Gaza's main hospital, where Israel says it has killed more than 170 gunmen in an extensive raid. UN Secretary General, meanwhile, visits the border with Gaza to renew plea for a ceasefire. A vote at the UN Security Council on a new text calling for an immediate ceasefire in Israel-Hamas conflict was postponed to Monday. The Israel Defense Forces conducted additional raids into Al Shifa Hospital on Friday as part of ongoing ground operations in the Gaza Strip. Israeli forces questioned over 800 suspects and located numerous weapons and terrorist infrastructures. Israel said its forces fighting in Gaza have killed more than 170 terrorists. Israel also vowed to launch a new ground assault in overcrowded Rafah in the south. Meanwhile, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres visited Egypt's border with Gaza on Saturday to renew pleas for ceasefire. Guterres also visited Al Arish in Egypt's northern Sinai, where much of the international relief for Gaza is delivered and stockpiled. Nothing justifies the horrific attacks by Hamas on October the 7th. And nothing justifies the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. Now more than ever, it is time for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. Meanwhile, aid parcels were airdropped over Gaza, delivering aid and relief materials. The Israel's military has also said it had opened a new entry point for aid to enter Gaza and was allowing unlimited supplies into the enclave. It was a week ago when we first launched those kind of operations together with the UN, uh, with coordination also with the US. So after giving the security clearance to the uh, humanitarian aid and to the convoy, to the trucks, we are escorting the trucks by the Israeli border, bypassing most of Gaza Strip. And from this point, uh, those trucks will go uh, directly up to the north parts of Gaza, to Gaza City, to Jabalia, and etc. A UN Security Council vote on a new immediate ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas conflict was postponed to Monday after the US-led draft resolution was vetoed by Russia and China. The US resolution stated that a ceasefire is imperative for the protection of civilians and to expand the distribution of aid to more than two millions. Aman Kumar's report for DD India. And DD India correspondent Alex Kadia joins us live from Tel Aviv. Uh, Alex, UN chief reiterates call for immediate ceasefire. Could his presence at the ground make a difference? Well, Shubendu, it's safe to say that even the Secretary General himself was somewhat sceptical of what the impacts of his uh, intervention could be. He said, it is clear that the Israeli government uh, does not normally do what I ask it to do. And that was in the context of an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, uh, which he said there was a consensus for when it comes to the United States, the European Union the United Nations and other of Israel's allies pushing for that humanitarian uh, ceasefire to allow uh, uh, what he said an ironclad commitment from Israel so that uh, unfettered humanitarian access could reach the Gaza Strip which he said of uh, speaking to aid workers who had been into the 
Gaza Strip, operating in Gaza, who had been working in the field for 25 years. They said they had never seen anything as bad as Gaza right now. And he said it's very difficult to not feel hugely frustrated with the situation. He also pointed out that on the Egyptian side of the Rafah border crossing into Gaza, there are dozens of aid trucks lining up not able to get into Gaza for those who so desperately needed. He called that a moral outrage. He hopes, he said, he hopes the Israeli government will heed that warning. But as I said, uh, some level of skepticism from the UN Secretary General today. And what is the latest on the Israeli operation in Gaza, particularly its plans for Rafah? Well, there's, uh, the, the operation is ongoing, as we know, in the last few days. Just today, we've seen seven uh, killed. This is according to local reports on the ground. Seven killed at uh, the uh, uh, Kuwait roundabout where aid was being distributed. Uh, again, local reports saying that shelling, Israeli shelling, came down killing seven people and that two were killed in an airstrike in central Gaza in Deir el Bala uh, just today. The other big operation, of course, ongoing operation is the Israeli raid of Al Shifa hospital in northern Gaza. The second time in four months the Israelis have raided that hospital. They say they've killed 160 people, arrested 600 people, but witnesses on the ground saying that the Israeli strikes and the Israeli gunfire have put medical staff and patients at risk and that five patients have died as a result of the operation and that uh, uh, 240 patients and 10 medical staff remain trapped in Al Shifa hospital as we're speaking to you. So those operations very much ongoing in the context of a potential further operation, as you mentioned, into Rafa, something the UN Security Gen Secretary General, I should say, Antonio Gutierrez said there was a consensus against. He said the United States had called it a mistake. The European Union had opposed an operation in Rafa, and the United Nations was opposed as well. But Prime Minister Netanyahu just yesterday said, even without international support, even without U.S. support, that operation in Rafa, whatever the consequences, will go ahead. Alex, thank you for those updates. Indian Navy has carried out sustained operations in the Gulf of Aden and Red Sea and off the coast of Somalia for the past 100 days. Today, INS Kolkata got back some 35 Somali pirates apprehended in a daring anti-piracy operation on 16th March. DD India's Nandita Dagar gets us more. Firm actions by the Indian Navy resulted in surrender of the pirate ship on 16th of this month. In an operation lasting over 40 hours that commenced in the early hours of 15 March, INS Kolkata intercepted pirate ship in the Arabian Sea. INS Kolkata, with the 35 apprehended pirates, returned to Mumbai on Saturday and handed over the pirates to the local police for further legal action in accordance with Indian laws. About 10 ships are present in this entire region uh, to counter all these, uh, to take part in all these three uh, tasks, anti-piracy, anti-hijacking, anti-missile and anti-drone. So right from the uh, Red Sea to the Gulf of Aden to uh, the North Arabian Sea and to the uh, east coast of Somalia. So this is the area that we are operating uh, where we have uh, deployed these ships. So the uh, task is to ensure that uh, we uh, ensure that there is safety, uh, security and stability so that uh, merchant vessels which, uh, uh, which are carrying our essential requirements, be it crude oil, be it products being taken back from here or fertilizers, all that, you know, reach our shores safely. India has been operating 10 ships in the Arabian Sea, Gulf of Aden and Red Sea to protect merchant ships from drone and missile attacks from Houthis and pirate attacks off the coast of Somalia. The uh, insurance rates have gone up, Abhi it has gone up by almost 35 to 40 percent. Uh, the container costs have gone up from $500, it has gone up to close to 2000 or 2000 dollars plus uh, more, uh, it was uh, shown in the briefing also that uh, almost 40 to 50 percent of the ships have uh, the companies have started rerouting their ships around the cape of good hope now is kya hoga your the uh, uh, freight charges will go up the insurance charges will go up and and where is the effect going to be felt the effect is going to be felt by you and me people like us as consumers. 
the navy chief has said that the operation sankalp will continue to protect seafarers and the indian crew from pirates and drone attacks nandita dagar for dd india Meanwhile, the United States said its forces conducted self-defense strikes against three Houthi underground weapon storage facilities in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen on Friday. In a statement posted on X, U.S. Central Command said strikes targeted capabilities used by the Houthis to threaten and attack naval and merchant vessels in the region. The forces also destroyed four unmanned aerial vehicles (UAVs) launched by Houthi in self-defense. Moving on, slow walks a vote in a presidential election on Saturday that could strengthen Prime Minister Robert Fico's grip on power. Fico sought more control over public media, softer anti-corruption laws and a dissenting voice to EU support for Ukraine. Fico's ally Peter Pellegrini has been a front-runner in the race to replace President Zuzana Kaptova, who is a fierce opponent to Fico. In recent years, voters have become polarized in Slovakia amid a global pandemic, war in Ukraine, high inflation, denting household budgets. U.S. lawmakers have passed on Saturday a $1.2 trillion spending package to avoid a government shutdown. The budget bill will keep the government funded for the next six months until the end of the fiscal year. The vote on passage was 74 to 24. The U.S. Congress handed to President Joe Biden to sign into law and avert a partial shutdown. Tonight, we have funded the government with significant investments for parents and kids and small businesses and health care workers, military families and so much more. It's no small feat to get a package like this done in divided government. These past few months have shown yet again that when bipartisan has room to work, we can get the job done. In the U.S., most states are holding primary elections this weekend, including Louisiana and Missouri. Presumptive Republican candidate Donald Trump and Democrat current President Joe Biden don't have serious challenges left. But these elections are a chance to see how strongly voters in these states support them. DD India correspondent Caroline Malone reports. Louisiana is a strongly Republican and Donald Trump supporting state. Their governor, Jeff Landry, is among them. Well, Trump won the state in the last presidential election in 2016 and 2020 with 58 percent of votes. He's likely to clinch Saturday's primary for the Republican Party with ease. Well, for the Democratic primary, there are options other than the current president, Joe Biden, which means they may take some votes away from him, including Marianne Williamson. Well, there are nearly three million registered voters in Louisiana, with just over a third of those turning up to vote in previous elections. Voting is open until 8 p.m. local time, with results due shortly afterwards. Well, on Saturday, there was also a Democratic primary in Missouri. Republicans already held their caucus there and chose Trump. For Democrats, there's also an uncommitted option on the ballot, so rather than choosing Biden as a sort of protest vote against his policy on Israel and concern over the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And any kind of vote in that direction could signal how big a problem it continues to be for his campaign. Results there are due early next week. Well, there are now 149 days left until the Democratic National Convention, when Biden is likely to be officially nominated as their candidate, and 114 days until the Republicans hold theirs in Milwaukee. Caroline Malone in Washington for DD India. Some updates on Haiti now. As gang violence spreads across the North American nation, almost half of Haiti's people are struggling to feed themselves with several areas close to famine. According to international organizations, inflation and poor harvest have also helped push Haiti to its worst levels of food insecurity on record. The Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, an organization which sets a scale used by UN and governments to assess hunger, says in a report that about 4.97 million people out of some 11 million are facing crisis or worse levels of food insecurity. Eight areas were now assessed to be in an emergency phase, the first level before famine. Let's now turn to other stories making news around the world. 
A Russian Soyuz spacecraft carrying a Russian, a Belarusian and an American to the International Space Station was launched from Kazakhstan's Baikonur Cosmodrome on Saturday. The launch was delayed on Thursday due to a problem with the chemical power source. Thousands of Thai devotees gather at Wat Bang Phra Temple near Bangkok to attend a spiritual tattooing ritual. Pay respect to the revered tattoo master Luang Fort Pen, a spiritual tattooist who passed away in 2002 but still has a strong following, particularly during the annual ceremony. Workers from Zara clothing stores owned by fashion giant Inditex protested outside their shops across Spain on Friday to demand better conditions after group reported record profits and raised shareholder payouts. The unions warned the retailer to offer more hours for part-time employees and minimum number of weekends off a year for all staff. Dozens of Hong Kong people residing in Taiwan held a protest against a new security law that took effect on Saturday, which critics say further threatens the china ruled city's freedoms. The package, known as Article 23, punishes offences including treason, sabotage, sedition, theft of state secrets, external interference and espionage with sentences ranging from several years to life imprisonment. And still to come on DT India News Hour. We talk about the Moscow terror attack. India's external affairs minister on a visit to the three ASEAN countries. Six former Congress MLAs of Himachal Pradesh join Bharatiya Janata Party. As it unfolds, we get to the heart of the matter. We don't just present facts, we demystify complex social, political and economic events. We break stories that shape the world's present and future because you deserve the truth. I am Tanvi Taneja from New Delhi. I'm Oli Barrett from London. I'm Nick Harper from Washington DC. Join us on DD India Global Monday to Friday at these times. Welcome back. You're watching TT India News Hour. I'm Shubhendu Ghosh. Our top stories. Over 140 killed, many injured in one of the deadliest terror attacks in Russia. 11 suspects detained. President Putin says those responsible would be punished. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres visits Egypt's border with Gaza says now more than ever it is time for an immediate ceasefire. Prime Minister Narendra Modi returns home after concluding historic visit to Bhutan. New milestones achieved in India's development partnership with the Himalayan Kingdom. We now return to our top story. Russia is recovering from its worst ever terror attack near Moscow. Talk about it. Joining us is Alok Bansal, Director, India Foundation and an expert on strategic affairs. Good evening and welcome, sir. Uh, Mr. Bansal, the shocking attack in Russia once again brings the menace of terrorism onto the global center stage. Undoubtedly, it's an extremely serious attack. Over 143 people killed a large number of people injured. And this actually shows uh, that jihadi terrorism, which many believed has been crushed and finished off, is not finished. It is still ticking. And this also tells the global community uh, that making compromises with this ideologically committed outfits is extremely dangerous and will bounce back and hit us very hard. And I think uh, this sort of an attack coming in a big city like Moscow shows that these terrorists uh, who have no heart, no sympathy and are willing to indulge in heinous acts of terror uh, would strike whenever we let our vigil go lax. 
So it's actually a message to the global community. Firstly, they need to be vigilant. It is also a message to them that these radical jihadi outfits need to be crushed completely. We cannot leave our job half done because of late there has been a tendency amongst the global community to feel that this terror from Islamic State and Al-Qaeda has actually uh, no longer exists in the world and people are looking at newer forms of uh, threats and I think uh, this attack has revived, uh, uh, again sensitized us to this grave threat that emanates from such terror out. Uh, one particular terror group, Islamic State uh, Khorasan, ISIS-K, uh, has taken responsibility for the attack. We talk about the reasons. Some experts also say that this particular terror group has been opposed to uh, Putin for long and this could be an outcome of that. See, we need to be very clear that firstly, Islamic State, by ideology, hmm. aims to establish a global Islamic emirate. Now, Khorasan chapter is a chapter of the Islamic State. Now, this particular chapter has been active in Uzbekistan, has been active in Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan, for some time, Russians and the global community have probably made up with Taliban, which actually is aligned with Al-Qaeda, which is actually a rival uh, group, but aims to achieve the same objectives. That is the establishment of a global Islamic Emirate. So in Afghanistan and some of the Central Asian states, Islamic State, uh, has been targeted by Russian forces and its allies. So that could be one region. But we need to understand mm. that even if this was not the case, Islamic State ideologically is in conflict with states like Russia, the United States and all other states which stand in the path of a global Islamic Emirate, which includes even India. And you mentioned that this group uh, has mostly been operating uh, uh, inside and just outside of Afghanistan. Carrying out an attack in Moscow, does it also mark a sort of uh, dramatic expanse of its operational capability? Uh, well, Islamic State as a whole is a global entity. Islamic State Khorasan chapter is actually usually confined to what is considered Khorasan, which includes Eastern Iran, Afghanistan, right. Pakistan, part of Central Asia, and according to some reports, India, part of India or full India. But uh, since they have uh, been operating in Central Asia, uh, this and Central Asian citizens and Central Asian people have been traveling uh, across the CIS. So they have an access, but this shows that their reach has expanded because till now, Khorasan chapter has primarily been operating and targeting uh, actors within what is perceived to be Khorasan. But this Khorasan chapter, we need to understand, is only a chapter of the Islamic State. So as long as Islamic State exists, as long as the emirate, the caliphates exist, and as long as their objective remains, they are going to strike whenever they find an opportunity. And uh, one must also ask uh, Mr. Bansal if this terror attack could have been averted. United States says that it had a credible intelligence, it had shared intelligence weeks in advance. Uh, if you could help us understand how do, how do these uh, strategic intelligence operate and could this be used by Russia to avert an incident like this? See, firstly, it uh, indicates that United States has managed to infiltrate many of these terror outfits uh, reasonably well. And that's how they would have got this input, because uh, uh, this input could have only have come through human intelligence, because hmm. what is intended would not come through uh, tech end or something. Now, when you get a human intelligence, it's uh, usually not feasible to give a specific uh, day and time if you have not got the input uh, at the last minute. Probably they got an input that uh, a concert is likely to be targeted. I think they communicated this to Russians. Uh, considering the existing environment and strategic uh, relationship between the two countries, Russians would have probably taken this information with a pinch of salt. Hmm. And that's probably contributed to this sort of an attack. Uh, because uh, intelligence uh, was, I think, to a very great extent, credible intelligence. Hmm. And uh, they may have beefed up security, may not have beefed up security. They may have felt that Americans who are supporting Ukraine in the Russia-Ukraine war are trying to dissuade them or probably divert their attention from something happening on the battlefield. 
so there are so many factors that could have taken place but according to american inputs they had given them a credible input that yes uh, there is going to be an attack on a concert and this can only come if there was an infiltration into these terrorist outfits and americans had a good level of human intelligence right uh, and so finally uh, we understand that no country uh, can say that it's immune uh, to uh, terrorism there's been 9/11 for america 2611 for india and many big and small terror attacks why has the international community then being equally vulnerable not being able to come together on a single platform against this menace and could this instance be an occasion to do that uh firstly yes this could be an uh, in this incident could be an occasion to come together more importantly we need to understand that many people in the globe do not understand the theological dimensions of terror because please understand outfits like islamic state al qaeda are governed by a theology they have a global agenda they have an agenda that is establishment of a global islamic emirate now that agenda is a long term agenda they may have certain short term agenda in the past we have seen that the global community is willing to make compromises with these outfits when they make statements which uh, seem benign uh, there have been occasions when outfits aligned with these outfits have said that our objectives are only very localized or temporary and i think uh, the global community needs to understand that these outfits have a long term agenda and which is going to pose a big threat to the global community and i think the day we start realizing the true nature of these outfits which many of us don't understand because most of the strategic analysts most of the security analysts do not have a good understanding of this jihadi theology and i think if they understand this they would come together and they would evolve strategies to counter it because please understand this sort of a terrorism cannot be countered by bombs and bullets it has to be countered by targeting the brain and for that you need to evolve a credible de-radicalization strategy where you have to target the brains of the potential targets you have to come out with a counter narrative then only can you succeed otherwise we are doomed to failure on that note mr alok bansal thank you for joining us on news are sharing your perspective Moving on, India's external affairs minister, Dr. S. J. Shankar, who is on a three nations visit, began his Singapore visit by paying homage to Netaji and the brave Indian National Army soldiers. S. J. Shankar is on an official visit to Malaysia, Singapore, and Philippines from March 23rd to 27th, at the invitation of his counterparts. The three nation visit of Dr. J. Shankar will focus on enhancing bilateral relations and would provide an opportunity for engagement on regional issues. of mutual concern and delivering a lecture titled why bharat matters in singapore india's external affairs minister s j shankar articulated that india had demonstrated robust foreign policy approach amidst the challenges posed by the covid pandemic but once we started responding other aspects of globalization were also visible and that too told us why foreign policy mattered uh, which was the producing vaccines itself we were in a way at the end of a complex global supply chain and every part of that chain which was really spread across multiple countries had to work if vaccines were to be delivered and one of my most uh, memorable i mean i would say actually honestly stressful uh, uh, memories of that period were going uh to the us uh in in uh, 2021 uh with a binder this thick about all the orders that had been placed uh across the world but in one way or the other which went through the us and you know until those were cleared really the global supply chain for vaccine production wouldn't work And Minister Jay Shankar said the current conflicts in Ukraine and Red Sea have affected supply chain impacting India's energy requirements. Now there was a time when conflicts could happen. It could happen somewhere else and we are in a different part of the world and you know its impact on us yes we read about it in the newspaper we saw it on the television and probably it stopped there. It may have had some consequences maybe on the markets. But if one looks today uh whether it is the conflict in ukraine 
or what is today happening in the Red Sea, we are seeing actually uh, what is an actual or potential or an averted major disruption uh, of our daily routine and actually of our way of living. Uh, in our case, I mean, uh, as, as a major energy importer, uh, when the Ukraine conflict started, I mean, we saw the price of energy, price of oil virtually double in that period. Even when it settled down finally, uh, it was about 50% higher than what it was before the conflict started. An external affairs minister, Zay Shankar, had productive interaction with leading Singaporean corporate figures. He appreciated their positive feedback on India, growth story, based on investment experiences. He exuded confidence in their commitment to doing more business in India. Let's now get you the latest on what's happening in India in the run-up to the world's largest democratic elections. Six former Congress MLAs of Himachal Pradesh who were disqualified as legislators joined the Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, in New Delhi on Saturday. Four-time MLA Sudhir Sharma, three-time MLA Ravi Thakur, Indardat Lakhanpal, first-time MLA Devendra Putto, Rajendra Rana and first-time MLA Chaitanya Sharma joined the BJP in the presence of Himachal Pradesh BJP chief and Union Minister Anurag Singh Thakur. Addressing the press conference, Union Minister welcomed all the MLAs. छोड़कर आए सभी माननीय छह विधायकों का दुनिया के सबसे बड़े राजनीतिक दल भारतीय जनता पार्टी में बहुत-बहुत स्वागत और अभिनंदन करता हूं। आप सब के आने के बाद भारतीय जनता पार्टी को और बल मिलेगा। हिमाचल प्रदेश में हम और शिक्षक्त होंगे। जिन वायदों को करके पिछली सरकार हिमाचल प्रदेश में बनी थी वो वायदे उतने ही झूठे थे जितने वो राजस्थान और छत्तीसगढ़ में थे और आपने उन चुनावों में भी देखा लोग पूछते थे कहां गई कांग्रेस की गारंटी गारंटी वहां फेल होने के 5 साल के बाद अवसर मिला था यहां सवा साल के बाद अवसर मिल गया है और सवा साल में जब चुनाव आया राज्यसभा का तो जनता का गुस्सा in the Vidhaikon ke roop mein bhi dekhne ko mila. The EVMs or electronic voting machines have revolutionized the election process in India and are now being used in almost all polls being conducted by the Election Commission of India. Here's a unique report on the story of EVMs. Electronic voting has become a hallmark of elections in India. Voting is done through the electronic voting machine or the EVM, which is a device used to electronically record and count votes. The Indian EVM system is also called ECI EVM, meaning an EVM specifically designed, manufactured, indigenously and used as per the Election Commission's rule. EVMs were first used in the Parur Assembly constituency in the southern state of Kerala in 1982. They were used in all 543 lower house constituencies during the 2004 general elections. An EVM consists of the ballot unit and control unit. To make the system more transparent, the voter verifiable paper audit trail or VVPAT was introduced. It was used across all the constituencies during the 2019 general elections. So how does an EVM VVPAT work? People cast their vote by pressing the button on the ballot unit next to the name and symbol of the candidate of their choice. A paper slip showing the details of the candidates is generated and is visible for about 7 seconds through the transparent window of VVPAT. The ECI EVM can record a maximum of 2000 votes. To better understand EVM's efficiency, it is important to look at how they fare in comparison to paper ballots which were earlier used in general elections. Since voting is done by pressing a button, there is no invalid vote unlike the paper ballot system in which votes may become invalid due to improper marking. An EVM can record up to four votes per minute, giving security forces ample time to respond to any booth capturing attempt. 
In the paper ballot system, there have been incidents of ballot boxes being stuffed with fraudulent votes. Counting of votes recorded in EVMs usually takes less than a day, while in paper ballot systems, manual counting can last for weeks. The use of EVMs reflects the evolution of the Indian electoral process with changing times and technology. Time for a short break. Still to come on DD India News Hour. Earth Hour celebration across the globe. Punjab Kings cruise to victory against Delhi Capitals in Indian Premier League cricket tournament. We just don't bring you the news as it unfolds, we get to the heart of the matter. We don't just present facts, we demystify complex social, political and economic events. We break stories that shape the world's present and future because you deserve the truth. I'm Tanvi Taneja from New Delhi. I'm Oli Barrett from London. I'm Nick Harper from Washington DC. Join us on DD India Global Monday to Friday at these times. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Shubhendu Ghosh. The Aam Aadmi Party throughout the day held multiple protests across the national capital against the arrest of Delhi Chief Minister and National Convener of Aam Aadmi Party, AAP, Arvind Kejriwal, by the ED. The political slugfest continued through the day with the BJP hitting back at AAP for corruption. AAP senior leader Atishi Malena claimed that ED Enforcement Directorate has no proof and that it is vendetta politics. The BJP, on the other hand, claimed that AAP was corrupt and that Kejriwal should resign as the Chief Minister of Delhi. Meanwhile, Kejriwal's wife, Sunita Kejriwal, released a video message of Arvind Kejriwal. Amid the ongoing political row over Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal's arrest, BJP leader Amit Malviya raised questions on AAP MP Raghav Chadda's London visit. Malviya asked why Raghav met British Labour MP Preet Gill who openly posts anti-India stuff on social media. Chadha's absence at a time when the party is going through a major crisis has raised eyebrows as MP has been in London since March 8th. Meanwhile, India has launched a strong protest with German side on their comments on internal events in India. According to a press release by the Ministry of External Affairs, the German Deputy Chief of Mission, George Ensenweiler, in New Delhi, was summoned and conveyed India's strong protest on their Foreign Office spokesperson's comments on India's internal affairs. MEA press release further states that such remarks are seen as interfering in a country's judicial process and undermining the independence of the judiciary. MEA further says that in all legal cases, law will take its own course in the instant matter. It called the biased assumptions made on the account as most unwarranted. As temperatures escalate, India's Health Ministry and National Disaster Management Authority have issued a joint advisory to states and union territories on measures to prevent hospital fires during summer months. States and union territories have been directed to ensure all accredited hospitals within their jurisdiction to conduct inspections and address discrepancy in electrical load capacity and obtain valid fire NOCs from respective state fire departments. States and union territories also urged to conduct follow-up reviews to ensure implementation of critical safety measures. Britain's Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, has announced she has been diagnosed with cancer. It follows weeks of speculation about her health after abdominal surgery early in the year. On Friday, Kate said she was undergoing preventive chemotherapy after a test taken that she had major abdominal surgery in January revealed that cancer had been present. In a symbolic gesture of collective commitment to preserve environment and promote sustainability across countries, observe the Earth Hour on Saturday. In India, numerous significant institutions and landmarks dimmed their light in observance of Earth Hour. 
The iconic India Gate, as you can see in the visuals, and Rashtrapati Bhavan in the national capital were among others who participated in the cause of climate awareness. Australia's Sydney Harbour Bridge and other buildings witness similar images. The lights on the sails of Sydney Opera House were switched off to mark Earth R. Other buildings across the city also went dark for the cause. And time now for all the action from the world of sports. Punjab Kings cruised to victory against Delhi Capitals in match two of the Indian Premier League cricket tournament. Capitals had put up 174 for the loss of nine wickets. Sam Curran's half-century guided Kings across the line with four wickets to spare. Skipper Shikhar Dhawan and Johnny Bestow started off with flurry of boundaries, but they were out in quick succession. Sam Curran and the impact player, Prabh Simran Singh, he added over 40 runs for the third wicket. Following Singh's dismissal, Curran was joined by Liam Livingstone. They used the short boundary to their advantage, especially when the bowlers bowled short to them. Capitals did not help their cause as they dropped chances, which proved costly to them. Curran was dropped on 33 and at the end, Harpreet Brar uh, let off by David Warner in the penultimate over. Khalil Ahmed introduced some excitement with two wickets and a drop catch, but Livingstone finished the match with a big six. Indian shuttler Kidambi Srikanth brushed past Lee Shea Hao 21-10, 21-14 in just 35 minutes to enter the semi-finals of Swiss Open. Srikanth, who had struggled to put together back-to-back -to -back wins on the BWF tour for months now, looked in great touch against the Chinese Saipei player who had beaten Lakshya Sen in pre-quarters. He will take on Chinese Taipei's Lin Shun Yi in the semi-finals. That's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. Let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Shubhendu Ghosh from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India News Hour. Namaskar.